get started tonight. We have been in our Mountain Climber series um, and we have been going through step by step. Sister Monica, are we ready? We, we have it up. We're ready to put it good. Um, on the Mountain Climber series, we have been really discussing um, in detail, step by step, of what it takes to climb the mountain and understanding how to climb the mountain, which is very important because we, we have been discussing is that um, from the spiritual standpoint, uh, climbing the mountain is important when we're talking about meeting God where he is at and not requiring and asking God to come down to us, but actually going up to him. Um, one of the things that I'm realizing is that the requirements of mountain climbing um, is, is helping us in so many different ways um, other than just church. It's, it's helping in every area of life, dealing with life in general. And I think and I praise God for uh, this, this series. It's, it, it's probably one series that I can say that um, has really been uh, changing me and transforming me even in the teachings of it. I'm learning more about myself. I'm learning more about, you know, my wife. I'm learning more about, you know, the church. And I'm even learning more about being uh, a, a, a pastor and a shepherd uh, because of this series. And so I'm just going to ask, if you would, just to continue to keep going back and reviewing and studying the steps and the scriptures that I've been giving you, because they will begin to get inside of you and they will become second nature to you. Um, as we have been going through these steps, let's just go through quickly. Um, we, we also understand that we must go up to meet him. And let's look at some of the steps that are required. Step one, if you would, Sister Monica, uh, rules to mountain climbing is the very first step is we have to make a conscious decision to go. Uh, make a conscious decision to go uh, because once you have made it up in your mind that you are not going to be conformed to this world but you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that conscious decision now in, in empowers you to now make different choices in life um, one of the statements that I've been making and understanding is right thinking produces right living right thinking produces right living when you think right you live right the reason why many people don't have a right life is because they don't have a right thought life. So if my thought life is off, my lifestyle is off. I'll, I'll then begin to compromise and accept and adopt things that I know are not good for me because my thoughts are off. So now my life is off. Is that making sense? So the second we must go to step is be willing to separate yourself from the familiar you have to be willing to separate yourself. One of the things that God uh, does whenever he's ready to, to he utilize anything is the first thing he does is he separates it. That word separation means to sanctify, to set it apart. Um, when you have made a conscious decision um, to, to go to the top of the mountain, that conscious decision means that you now have to separate yourself from the familiar things of life. Um, it's the familiar things of life, and it's interesting because the word familiar has that same root word as family. You become associated with it. And if you're not careful, you become so familiar with things that even though they're bad for you, you still can't separate yourself from them, so they keep you from going to that next place in life. You have to be willing to separate yourself from the familiar. Come on, number three. Thank you, Sister Monica. Along this, uh, tr this trip, this uh, journey toward the top of the mountain, you have to learn how to endure the hard places. Uh, please remember as you're going through this that hard places are signs that you're headed in the right place. Hard places in life are signs that you're headed in the right place. Um, I, I love how God operates and does what he does because a lot of times in life we start to endure hard places and we think what's wrong. But I'm learning in God's way of doing things that when we come into hard places is actually we're doing something right. Because sometimes God will allow situations and circumstances to come into our life and they will become roadblocks so you can't go any further. So you have to take a different direction in life and now he's putting you right where he wants you to be. Endure the hard places along the way. Number four, once you have now made this decision to go to the top of the mountain, you'll understand that if the enemy can't stop you from going to the next level and you've learned to endure the hard place to get to the next level, then his job is to get you to look back to what you came out of. So the number four is don't look back. Don't look back. When you begin to look back, 
you now begin to stop moving forward. Number five, don't listen and get distracted by outside influences. Don't listen and get distracted by outside influences. One of the enemy's uh, biggest uh, tricks to keeping you from moving forward is to try to get you distracted. Um, I, I'm, I'm starting to see that in this season right now, um, that one of the, the biggest ways that the enemy can keep us from going where God wants us to go is by using distractions in your life. People, places, and things can be distractions. And when you've made that decision to now separate yourself from the familiar, you have to be careful not to allow those same things that you separated yourself from to now come and now welcome themselves back into your life because they now become distractions. Once you close the door to the past, keep the door closed to the past. Don't invite it. Don't welcome it. Don't let it back in because now what you're doing, it might be just for a moment, but that moment is all the enemy need to distract you from your destiny. Number six, trust God along the way. Trusting God along the way is so important because now we start to understand that when we get to this point, we did not get here, amen, amen, with a whole lot of what I would call God's strength. Most of these things that you see, we did these things on our own. And one thing you have to understand is you can go through life and do a whole lot on your own, but there will become a time and a season that God will bring you to a point in life where you'll realize I can't do anything else on my own. And I'm at a point where I see that when you get to this point, you can only trust God because if God doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. I can't go any further in my own strength. I can't go any further in my own abilities. I can't use my own education or even my own resources because God will find a way to dry everything up so that you will now begin to depend on him. And now he's saying, now do you trust me? You trusted me when you had a thousand dollars in the bank account. Can you now trust me when you don't have two dollars in the bank account? Because now you can't buy your way out. Now you can't buy your way up. Now you can't find nobody to help you get out of your situation. So now you're at a point that you got to trust God and God alone. Am I talking to anybody right about now? You've got to trust God along the way. And I thank God because there's times and situations that God will allow to come into your life that he's actually setting you up so that you learn how to trust him. Because they, they used to say this all the time. If you never had a problem... You wouldn't know that God could solve them. You would not know that God would see you through. You've got to learn how to trust God. And on this journey, trusting God is going to be very important after you get past verse, this step six. Because step six is going to require now that you need something greater than yourself to get you to step seven. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. This is where Jesus steps in and he says, are you going to now allow me to take complete control to take you to where I want you to go because this is now where the journey begins to now become no more just natural and physical but now it becomes more spiritual than anything because he's now starting to reshape reform and renew your mind and now you don't see things the way you used to see them you don't allow the things on the outside to distract you because you start to realize now I've come too far by faith and I cannot go back now I don't know about you, but there's a point in time where God will put you out so far that you start to realize, God, I've been set up. I can't go back now, and I feel like I can't go anywhere else but forward, so you've got me in a place that, guess what? Forward is the only direction because going back is no longer an option. <laughs> right. I thank God for that because if it was up to me, I probably would go back. I probably would turn around but that's why God removes everything out of your past so you have nothing to turn around and go back to amen come on now that we've got to the top of the mountain we realize that the one thing we have to do now is we have to praise him upon arrival and 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 praising him upon arrival is not watch this sitting back and watching everybody else praise him but you learned that I did not get here with everybody else. I got here with his help. And so I'm praising him and not everybody else. I don't have to wait for nobody to tell me to praise God. Because I realized during this journey what it took for me to get here. 
and it was difficult to get here and so while I'm here I might as well praise him it doesn't matter what everybody else does it doesn't matter what everybody else think because I've got a testimony that nobody else can understand because nobody had to go through what I had to go through to get here is there anybody in here right now that can just look back over their life and say Lord if it had not been for you on my side where would I be I'd be sitting here right now losing my mind I should be sitting up in somebody's mental institution I should have lost my mind a long time ago I should be strung out on drugs right about now I should be six feet under and if it had not been for you God I got to praise you I've got to praise you I've got to praise you and after the praise is over with and after the praise is done, here's the problem because a lot of times we leave and we go from church after a good praise and a good shout and we go back and we realize now what? What do I do after the praise? What do I do after the celebration? Because there's got to be more than just praising God. I've got to do something now after the praise is over. Because realistically, guess what? Sometimes you have to realize that you are not always going to be in a place of praise. I know the Bible says you shall bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall be continually in your mouth. That sounds good, but that's not realistic. There are some times where you have to, after praise, understand, God, what is it you want me to do now? This is what we need to do. Number eight, we need to meet God and receive our purpose. Meet God and receive our purpose. So now that I'm at the top of the mountain, I've praised him. Now I've got to meet him. And now that I meet him, become intimate with him. And now he begins to birth purpose in my life. Last week, we were talking about, does everyone understand what their purpose is? Everyone has the same purpose. And that purpose goes back to Genesis because the word purpose means your intent. Your original intent. And God's original intent for all mankind was the same. In Genesis 1.26, let us create man in our image and after our likeness. That was the intent of man. His intent for all mankind was to have dominion. That's the intention for all mankind, to have dominion. We talked about what dominion was. Dominion is authority plus power equals dominion. So now that you have that down, you'll understand now why God gave you dominion. Because he had a gift and a call that he placed inside of you that made you so unique that only you can do what God has called you to do. I was having a conversation today with one of my mentors and I thank God for her because she actually said something that just blessed my, my I mean, just blessed me, blessed my heart. And she said, this is how I see God. God looks down into the earth and he comes up with a, an intention. He comes up with a creative idea. And when he comes up with the idea, he looks into the earth and he says, I want to carry out something in the earth. And he says, and now what I must do is I must create somebody to fulfill that purpose that I have for them. And only one perfect person can do it and he created you to get it done each one of you are sitting here right now as a unique gift to fulfill the purpose of God for him in the earth from heaven so what happened was God did not create man and then say now I've got to give him a purpose he says I've got a purpose and I've got to create man to fulfill it huh when you see that, you now get over folks walking around feeling like they have no self-esteem, feeling like they are inadequate, walking around not wondering, do, am, do I really have a purpose? Please understand, if you didn't have a purpose, you wouldn't be here right now. Because God knew that only you could carry out what he had intended for you to do from the very beginning. And he says, nobody else can do it. So I've got to now create somebody specific and special to carry out what I've got in my mind. And when you understand that, you'll understand now what we're about to go to. Come on, we go now to number nine, enjoying the new view. Because now this new view gives me a new perspective because the new perspective is no longer my view of myself, but now my view is of who he is. I'm not thinking about me anymore. It's all about him now because now his plans for my life are more important than I have plans for my own life. That's a new view. And so what begins to happen is we begin to realize at this point in time, and I need to say this, that I've been sitting in church for years. I've been under teachings for years. But somewhere down the line, some of us come to the point that we get convicted right in the middle of a service. And we realize I've been saved, but I've never been born again. Pastor, how can you say that? Because we have to understand that when you have been born the first time, all mankind is born into the earth selfish. We go through life selfish. I said it yesterday. 
A baby comes into the world, he's hungry, he cries. He doesn't think about the fact that maybe mama cannot feed me right now. I don't care, mama, I'm hungry. A baby gets wet, it begins to cry because it wants to be changed, it wants to be dry right now. I'm not waiting until it's convenient for you. You better change me right now or I'm going to throw a fit because I'm a baby and I'm selfish. The problem with it is, is that we continue to grow and we never change and we always remain selfish. So now we're 30 years old because we've only been born once and because of our first born experience, we remain selfish all our life. So now I come to church, I'm a Christian, and I've been in church for 25 years. I know the word from Genesis to Revelations, but the first time somebody says something to me, I get offended because I'm selfish and it's all about me, and I throw a fit because I've never been born again. Because being born again now gets rid of being selfish, and it takes you into a place now you're selfless, so it's no longer about me, it's all about him. So I don't care about my life, it's all about his life. That's being born again. So then we come to a service like yesterday and for the very first time people begin to hear about being born again. They say, you know what? I've been sitting in the church but I've never understood that. Now I realize what it really means and now I want to be born again because I'm tired of being selfish. I want to live the good life. And I have a new view of what it really means to be a Christian that's born again. So now we come to tonight. And we now are going to be ready to understand why we have to be born again. Because for us to be born again, we have to partake now in his divine nature. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse 10 with me, if you would, please. Ephesians 2, look at verse 10. Is everybody getting it? Ephesians 2, verse 10. Sister Monica, could you please put that in the amplified version for me? Now that we've gone through a review. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 in the Amplified Version says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship. Please understand that when the Bible talks about that we are his handiwork or his workmanship, that means that we're under construction. That means that I'm not completed yet, but I'm going through the process of being completed. And because I'm in his hand, I'm going through the process of being worked on. So that's why I'm called his handiwork. I'm his workmanship. And here's the part where it says, and I'm being recreated. Somebody say recreated. In Christ Jesus. So what I love about this is that what we have been doing is bringing people down, Elder Smith, to the altar. And we get them born again. And we tell them to accept Jesus into their heart. Please understand that that's not even scriptural. It's not biblical. Because instead of us having people have Jesus come into our heart, we need to have people come into Christ. Because when we have people come into him, what begins to happen is he now takes us in and he begins to recreate us. That word recreate means re to do again and cre create means to form and fashion mm -hmm. and as we are in him you have to understand something let me, let me share like this do we have any oh thank you mr augustine it's interesting because when you went to pottery class and what they would do is they would want to now make a vase they would take a mold and they would pour the clay in the mold and they would now place it into, watch this, an urn or a furnace to now heat it up so that everything on the inside now molded in shape to the mold that it was placed inside. So now when the mold comes off, <sighs> the heat now created what was inside the mold to be in the same image as the mold itself. So when God spoke and said, I will create man in my image and after my likeness, he said, Jesus Christ will be the mold. And I want to pour you into him and you stay in him and the heat 
and the pressures of the world would now begin to shape and form you into his image so that now when you come forth and come out, they are going to see Jesus in you. We become the mold. <sighs> we become like the mold. And now we become the shape and the form of the mold. But the problem with it is, is as soon as the heat heats up and the pressures come, we don't stay in the mold long enough for it to now recreate us. And so when we step out, now we are no longer ready to now fulfill the purpose that he had for our lives. Because it says we were created in him, born anew, that we may do those good works which God had already predestined. Please understand something. God has already predestined what he wants you to do. But you have to stay in the mold long enough so you can now be ready and equipped to go forth and do what God has called you to do. What has God called me to do? I, I, I've been giving you guys nuggets and I, I, I want to drop as much as I can on you as they come to me. Write this acronym down. I woke up this morning and God gave me the acronym PVC. He gave me PVC. And I said, Lord, what in the world? Are you getting ready to take me back into remodeling houses and putting PVC back into? I said, I don't want that. That's Dick and Tolly's job. I, I'm not a plumber. And I'm not messing with that. PVC. And I began to keep studying and kept reading and kept praying. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, that's an acronym. He says, the P stands for purpose. Somebody say purpose. The V stands for vision. Somebody say vision. And C stands for calling. Somebody say calling. Now, please understand this. When you understand purpose, vision, and calling, what it begins to do is start to prepare you for the divine nature of God. Because purpose, again, you have to realize what it is. It's God's intent. That's purpose. God's intent. God's intent is purpose. Vision, all right, is what you see that God is doing to bring forth his purpose in your life. And calling is what you hear God telling you to do to carry out that purpose in your life. PVC. Purpose is God's intent for your life. Vision is what you see God doing through your life. And calling is what you hear God telling you to do to bring forth his purpose through your life. PVC. Now when you get in God and you get in Christ. God in Christ gets in you. And so many of you right now have to understand that your purpose is to now operate in the dominion that God has called you to operate in. You now have to look with inside yourself and find, God, what is it that I see you doing through me that I can now operate in that dominion? And if you stay there long enough, You'll begin to hear God tell you and speak to you and give you your calling that you will be able to now come forth out of that mold where you can now walk in dominion and you can now walk like Christ walked when he was in the earth. That's why he said greater work shall you do because I go into the father. Now that right there should let people know that there's a divine nature that God has called us to partake in. Come with me, if you would, to John chapter 17. Look at verse 23 with me. You can go ahead over to the King James Version, Monica. John 17, look at verse 23. John 17, 23. That's a good one, too. We're going to go there one day, too. I'm, 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 I'm going to talk about Jonah. But we're going to talk about John right now. I in them and you in me. That they. Look at this. I in them and you in me. That they may be made perfect in one. This is unity right here. This is union right here. This is partaking in the divine nature. You should get to a point where you are spending so much time in him. And he's spending so much time in you. That you become perfect in one with him. 
You should be able to know what he knows, see what he sees, and hear what he hears. Real union and unity with Christ, please stay with me and hear this, is taking the time that you are spending in the throne room with God that you begin to eavesdrop and overhear the conversations between Jesus and God alone. That's partaking the divine nature. Have you ever wondered how it was that Jesus was able to walk out in every situation and had dominion over that situation and never struggled, never had to worry, didn't turn around and have to have prayer lines, didn't turn around. I, I, I remember the story about they came and they said, Jesus, we need to pay taxes. Jesus says, oh, really? He didn't turn around and say, go get another job. He didn't say go on the corner and start selling meals. Jesus said, go look in that fish's mouth. Go look in that fish's mouth and open up his mouth. How in the world did Jesus know that there would be a coin in the fish's mouth? How? Because he was spending so much time with the Father that when the situation arose, he had enough divine nature of God that in the morning, God had already told him what was going to happen and already gave him a solution before the problem. Wouldn't you love to be in a situation where you had a solution even before the problem? We wait for the problem to ask God for the solution because we don't take time to get the solution before the problem. There's been situations and times that I've actually stumbled upon this. There's been times where I've been in, par in situations where I didn't even know that I was actually partaking in the divine nature of God. There were situations where I've actually had the solution even before the problem and didn't even know it. And I'm telling you that you can be intentional in living a life where you can always be ahead of the game and instead of behind it. God wants us as citizens of the kingdom to be proactive, not reactive. Things should not come upon us by surprise. We should have so much dominion in our workplaces. We should have so much dominion in our homes. We should have so much dominion in our families that nothing ever comes in and we get caught off guard by it. But what begins to happen is we say, oh, I knew that was on its way and I've already got the solution before the problem. That's because we're partaking in his divine nature. The reason why a lot of us don't take time, because he says, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect and that the world may know that you have what? Sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We have been sent into the world. But please understand, if you have not been spending time, you're not being sent. You just went. I said, you haven't been sent. You just went because God's not going to send you unprepared and, and equipped. Because God is not the God who's going to set you up for failure. So let me just put this out here for some of you right now because a lot of us need just to hear truth and we don't want to hear truth. If you're struggling right now, if you're going through right now, if you right now are feeling like you don't have enough resources to handle the task that has been assigned to you, it possibly could be because you went instead of being sent. Because for every vision, there is provision. So anytime that God sends someone, he equips them with everything that they need. You've got to take time to be honest with yourself if you want to get this thing right. You've got to be able to take a step back and say, God, maybe I did go prematurely. Maybe I did go out on my own. Maybe I didn't take time to let you prepare me and equip me. And because of that, because of zeal, because of passion, because I thought that I was being doing the right thing, but I was really being misled by my flesh divine nature and this is where God is God he said you've celebrated and praised you've got a new perspective but this is the reason why you had to be born again because to be born again means you're selfless not selfish and when you're selfish you go when you're selfless you stay oh I said when you selfish you go when you selfless you stay 
When you understand that it's not about you, you're not so quick and ready to run and go do. You're more prepared. Watch this. I'm going to show you by scripture uh, of two women. One's name was Mary. The other one's name was Martha. We see two women with the same purpose and had the same opportunity. One went, the other stayed. One was working and became overwhelmed. The other one was sitting and received the presence of God and was able to rest. You've got to ask yourself, who am I? Am I Mary or am I Martha? Sometimes you could be doing a whole lot of things for God, but doing so much for God that you don't have time to actually know God. You can be doing so much for the kingdom. Ministering and serving and doing and working and holding titles and positions and being in church and spending your whole entire life. You took the motto and the vision of 24-7, 365 to a whole nother level. You 24 7 366. <laughs> but doing so much of it that God's nowhere in your plans. You haven't taken time to partake in His divine nature. God's intent for mankind is to walk in dominion, and the only way you can walk in the dominion is you got to remain in Him. Because remember the formula for dominion. I've been laying groundwork for each one of us. What's the groundwork? What's the formula for dominion? Talk to me. Authority plus power equals. Now, authority belongs to who? Power belongs to who? So if you need his power, how are you going to do anything outside of him? You have the authority with no power. That's called impotence. And we've got a lot of impotent Christians, not impotent, impotent. Because of the fact they have authority, but they have no power because they're not taking time to spend with him. Um, I want to put this to, 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 to rest right now. When you partake in his divine nature, you walk like him, talk like him, act like him. And when demons see you, they actually see Christ. Every single time you see Jesus show up on the scene, demons begin to tell on themselves. Jesus didn't have to walk out and say, come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you in the name of Jesus. Jesus just shows up on the scene. And they begin to tell on each other. They become snitches. I can just see Jesus show up on the scene and one demon gets to tremble. Another one goes, shh, be quiet. He's going to know we're here. One demon can't keep his mouth closed. He goes, son of David, have you come to torture us before our time? Oh, the demon tells him, I said, if you would have been quiet, he would have known. I had to. He's Jesus. He's been spending time with God. I can't keep my mouth quiet. Did you read the scripture? We read it. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord. Demons begin to tell on themselves. Jesus didn't have to go in driving out and, and casting out. Jesus just had to be Jesus. He says, I've come so that you will know that I am who I say I am. He says, if I cast out a demon by the finger of God, then you should know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's divine nature. What's divine nature? Let's look at this real quick here because we have to understand partaking is divine nature. You have to know his nature. Nature. That word nature is very important because when we start to understand that word nature, we'll understand what it's for. And the divine nature of God, that word nature is actually the characteristics of a thing. It's the characteristics of a thing. Somebody said the characteristics. The basic or inherent feature of something, especially when it's seen as its characteristics. That word nature is the basic or inherent feature of something. So when we're talking about the divine nature of God, we're talking about his basic inherent feature. 
his features, his characteristics. And if you understand that you're spending time with God, you're not spending time so you can get a word from the Lord so you can preach to the masses. I hear people say that all the time. That's the goofiest thing in the world. Let me tell you something. I can help about four or five of you right about now. When you're spending time with God to give a word to the people, you're actually trying to use God for his word for the people. Let's put this in proper perspective. Real ministry takes place out of the overflow of what God has placed in your heart. Um, when I stand up here and I teach and I preach, please understand something. I'm not giving you what I have coming from my cup. I'm giving you what came down into my saucer. See, some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about because y'all don't know about cups and saucers. I, I want to, I want, I got to talk to my old schools for a minute. I got to talk to some folks that know what I'm talking about. Amen. Hey, some of y'all young folk, y'all still walking around, y'all walking around with, amen, just. There was a time they had what was a cup and a saucer, amen. Y'all look at them saucers and be like, ain't that a little plate? That must just be for the appetizers. That's not what that little plate is for. That saucer was to actually to catch what actually fell from the cup. So if you had an overflow of the cup, it ended up in the saucer. So you didn't get it everywhere else. I just told you, I don't minister to you out of my cup. The cup is for me. But as I continue to drink out of the cup, and I keep drinking out of the cup, there becomes an overflow that now ends up in my saucer, and now you get what's in the saucer, not out of my cup. <sighs> Be very careful in ministry, because if you minister to folks out of your cup, you're not going to have enough for you. So you're going to turn around and run dry, and now you're trying to find something that should have been for you. Good God Almighty, stop ministering to the folks out of the cup and start ministering out of the saucer, out of your overflow. If you ain't taking time to get no overflow, then sit down and quit trying to minister to folk. So partaking in his divine nature means that you spend enough time to where he begins to fill you up. And he puts so much of himself inside of you that you can't even contain it. That it begins to now become an overflow and it begins to ooze out of you. And everywhere you go, your presence becomes like the presence of God all around you. And so now his nature, his inherent features and his characteristics now begin to now overtake your inherent features. And now your born again experience becomes his characteristics now become my characteristics. And so now when folks see me, they really start to see him. But if you don't spend any time with him, how will you ever know his features? How will you ever know his characteristics? If all you do is you come to church to get a good word, but you're not willing to take that word and let it get in you so that now you become good by the word. Church is just more than a gathering. But church should actually become an equipping. God, I'm getting equipped for what you have for me. This is the reason why a young girl can come down to the altar and a couple days before she's talking about doesn't even know much about speaking in tongues. But comes down in faith and now she realizes I must be born again and she stands down at the altar and she just opens up her mouth and she begins to praise God and now all of a sudden God begins to pour so deep down inside of her that everything that he's put down inside of her now must come out and now all of a sudden his spirit begins to rush out of her and out of her belly flows like living, living waters and she begins to now speak with a new language and now the Holy Ghost begins to speak for her. Why? Because she began to now partake in his divine nature so now it's no longer my words but it's now his words and now I have become one along with him now God did
didn't do that so that folks could run around and say, oh, now look, she's speaking in tongues. No, because a couple hours later, she gets a phone call from a friend, and that friend now has a question that needs to be answered, and now I can't give them my opinion. I can't tell them what I think. I can't tell them how I feel. I got to give them the Holy Ghost. I got to give them something that God is saying from heaven into the earth. Use me, Lord. Use me. I got the authority to speak, but if I don't have the power to speak, then close my lips. So it's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost now. Because I got dominion. I got dominion over my flesh now. I got the authority to speak and I got the power of the Holy Spirit to speak through me. So now I'm ready to walk in dominion. I've been equipped. I've been charged. I'm ready to go forth. And that's what God is wanting for each and every one of us. He wants us to be able to walk in such a dominion that when we walk through any place, anywhere, the demons begin to tremble. Because that's our assignment. Our kingdom assignments. As citizens of the kingdom, please understand we're not peasants. We're sons. <laughs> Y'all better start changing your mindsets. I'm not a peasant. I'm not a second class citizen. I'm a king and I'm a priest. I am royalty. And when I walk in, guess what? Even demons begin to bow. <laughs> what is man that you're so mindful of him? That you would create the angels a little lower than them. The scripture. Psalm chapter 9. He lets us know. That when God created you. He created you in, with status. He created you above. He created you.